What is up, Bitcoiners? Welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. For this week's show, I sat down with Brady Swenson, head of education at Swan Bitcoin and the host of Citizen Bitcoin podcast. Brady and I are very good friends and we've been hanging out and talking Bitcoin for a while. We've been on several podcasts and shows together, and this was another one for the books. We caught up, drank beers, and chatted about how he got started in Bitcoin and how he went from a casual observer to leading one of the hottest startups and being one of the initial members of Swan Bitcoin and really creating quite the presence for himself in the Bitcoin community. Um, Brady's journey from Bitcoin pleb to rockstar is absolutely repeatable. Um, you guys, there's so much room for Bitcoiners to enter and get paid by Bitcoin. And Brady is just a shiny example of someone who had the grit and the motivation to put in the hard work and and build the reputation and really thrive in this space. So I think this is going to be a very useful podcast for all the Bitcoiners out there that are dreaming of working in Bitcoin. We also get really cosmic and talk about life after Bitcoin, post-hyper Bitcoinization, how the world is going to deal with adopting Bitcoin and what Bitcoin does to us and changes us. Um, so this is a really, um, really fun show. So I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Before we get into the interview, though, let me tell you guys about Level. So Level's been sponsoring the show for a while now, LVL.co. It is a new type of Bitcoin bank and savings account. Instead of thinking of a Bitcoin exchange as like a brokerage, Level wants to be a fintech company that builds with Bitcoin. So they give you an FDIC checkings account, but they also give you a Bitcoin wallet and they give you free and no fee exchanges with no hidden spread, nothing, absolutely free trading between your wallet and your checking account. Um, and they want to be the hub for all of your Bitcoin banking. So in the future with Level, let's say you're a Level customer, you're getting paid in fiat from your job, you're getting that direct deposited into your Level account. You can set how much of that you want to be automatically transferred into Bitcoin. So with Level, you could get paid in BTC if you wanted to. You could do a 10%, 90%, 70%, 30%, whatever you are comfortable with. Level wants you to be banking with Bitcoin. If you want a personal Bitcoin standard, Level is the place for you to achieve that with full fiat exchanging and everything like that and no fees whatsoever. Check out LVL.co today. I think it's really exciting that we have on ramps that are moving in this direction of more of a challenger bank style. So very excited for Level and very excited to see where they push Bitcoin. All right, guys, that is enough for me. Let's get into this awesome interview with Brady Swenson. What is up, Bitcoiners? How's it going? This is CK, and uh, I'm hitting here cracking open beers with my boy, Brady Swenson. Cheers, man. Welcome to the show. Cheers. Oh, glad to be here, brother. Anytime I get to talk and hang out with CK is a good day. Yeah, so the way that we uh, organize this show is because we've kind of been playing phone tag, uh, trying to schedule a time to chat. And I was like, hey, let's just let's just turn it into a podcast. That way we know <laughs> it actually happens. Uh, I think the last time we had a we had a hangout, just me and you, it was on on Citizen Bitcoin. Yeah, it's so apparently we only hang out on podcasts uh, or rooftops, one or the other. Yeah, well, you know what? I'm all, I'm all right with that. I, I I would like to hang out more. So apologize for for all the time in between, but happy to have you here on Bitcoin Magazine podcast this time. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about a, lot, a bunch of things, but one of the things I wanted to focus on to start is kind of your journey into Bitcoin, right? Like before we started, I was saying, you know, you started as just, you know, an average Bitcoiner on Twitter and uh, you were into it, but you weren't like really involved in Bitcoin. Um, and then you went and became a podcaster and grew one of you know, the, the best Bitcoin podcast in the space. And then Thanks, you dude. started, you know, sis, or you started Swan Bitcoin uh, with Corey and Jan and was, you know, what, what you employ number three or four, like just right there from the beginning. So, you know, kind of want to go through that whole journey and how you establish yourself in this space. Holy shit, man. It's been a crazy ride. Oh God. It's three years now uh, since I started doing the Citizen Bitcoin podcast. And I was actually just recording with Tom, uh, Tommy, my friend, who I started the podcast with. So yeah. the first like, first like 20 episodes are just me and Tommy 
speaking into the void about Bitcoin because there are only like 50 people downloading the show, <laughs> you know, it was great. It was great. And we just loved Bitcoin. We got the, the bug bit us. We dove down the rabbit hole. And fortunately, he had he was there at my co-working space and we started talking about it. He had a lot of experience in finance and investing and all that stuff. And he was into Austrian economics and was a gold bug. And so he was kind of predisposed and he knew about Bitcoin, but he hadn't really studied it yet and uh, saw me trading Bitcoin, the big old uh, trading view thing on, on my screen like every day. He used to trade commodities. So it caught his eye and he came over to the desk and he was like, what, what are you doing there, man? And I told him, you know, I was trading this new thing called Bitcoin. And you got to hear all about it. Well, he showed a little bit of interest, right? So I was just like, yes, let's talk all about it because this is all I'm thinking about and no one else wants to hear me talk about it, but you do. So let's talk about it. And that's how it happened. We started recording our shows and put them out there. And we just did like little weekly, I think it was every other week actually at that point. So that was it. That was how I got started. The 2017 rally, I got in kind of late spring 2017 and started watching Andreas videos, uh, got hooked uh, by Vitalik Shtick for a while. So I was into Ethereum. You know this, uh, your friend David who is the only Ethereum I follow on Twitter. And I do listen to POV Crypto. And I have respect for David. I like David a lot. Uh, I'm holding this shirt hostage that I have, this Ethereum shirt I'm saving for. I would have thrown it out by now. But it's, it has a spot in my top drawer of my desk. And I just every time I open it up, I see and I, and I come across it, I think of David and Ethereum and like these, you know, couple of months where I was all about it. <laughs> Keeps you humble. Yeah, exactly. So that happened. And by the end of the year, I had met enough Bitcoiners and, and started, you know, Ansel Lindner, actually, who's a co-host of your other show, FedWatch, which is amazing. Huge shout out to Ansel. He had one of the only podcasts going at that point, actually, because Tales from the Crypt didn't start until like late 2017. Same with what Bitcoin did. Same with Stefan Levera. Everybody sort of those three big podcasts really started around then. And I definitely was an early subscriber and listener to those. But Ansel had been going on for a long time, Bitcoin and markets. And finding his podcast made me a Bitcoiner. So shout out to Ansel for that. He's an awesome dude, an awesome Bitcoiner. And I just humble as can be, smart, cool. So good guy. I'm glad that you've gotten to know him. Yeah, you know, I want to hear what's crazy about Ansel is that I was orange pilled by Ansel and I was just talking to Nick Badia, which is the podcast that is coming out right before this one. And he shouted out to Ansel too, as being one of the first influences for him. Uh, so Ansel's the man uh, and he really brings it from a macro perspective. Um, he's just a historian and an economist that gets Bitcoin and was into it early. So uh, an enormous amount of respect for him. Absolutely. hundred yeah. percent. Love that guy. Good, good fix on the camera, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Is this going on video too? Uh, yeah, but we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll make it work. Sorry about that. Yeah, definitely big respect for Ansel. Appreciate him. I'm glad he's on FedWatch with you and getting some more, some more work. He definitely deserves it on the Bitcoin front. From 2018 onward, I think maybe in the spring, I started uh, interviewing other Bitcoiners. I sort of felt like I had enough understanding of what was going on that I could actually justify sitting across, you know, a Zoom from Matt O'Dell or Pierre Rochard or one of those guys. And so I made a list of the 10 Bitcoiners I'd want to interview. And every single one of them said yes, which I was shocked by at that point. But now I just know, you know, anybody who wants to start up in the space, like you want to start a podcast, you're going to get whoever you want on the podcast. We're still at that point in Bitcoin's history where it's everyone's just, you know, ready to help you out are, anybody else who's wanted, wants to do something in the space. You'll at least get Pierre Richard. Like the man is, <laughs> he, he is truly like a saint of Bitcoiners. Like he was one of the first Bitcoiners to follow me. He retweets everyone that's saying, you know, something that he believes in. He doesn't care. He's just there to, uh, to amplify Bitcoin. So I got to give a huge shout out to Pierre. Yeah, Pierre is just, it's so true. He'll interact with everybody. He's an incredibly humble dude. I remember, you know, meeting him the first time I met him. I, you know, was not 
the real world Pierre did not match up with my Twitter, you know, concept of Pierre. He's just like the sweetest dude. And I thought about him more of like this, uh, you know, sort of reserved uh, intellectual who, you know, is going to, yeah, I, I don't know. It just it was different uh, than I expected. Anyway, Pierre is awesome. So shout out to Pierre as well. Uh, yeah, that's where it, that's where it really started. So by the end of 2019, I'd done about probably 70 or 80 shows at that point. Corey reached out to me because uh, he was starting Give Bitcoin, and he wanted to advertise for the holiday season. And so he reached out to me, and it was my first sponsor actually, which was awesome. It was really exciting. I'd been looking for a sponsor for the show for a while, and I would only you know entertain Bitcoin only companies, so that makes your choices extremely narrow. And everybody was already sponsoring someone else. So I was really excited about that. And Corey and I really just hit it off. And uh, about a month later, we were talking, catching up. And he asked me what I did for my day job. And I told him that I do been doing, you know, just working online, basically every aspect of the web for 20 years and marketing, d developing, designing. Uh, so kind of had my toe and everything. And he was like, okay, well, we need somebody like that. And I started on a contract and started just working on Give Bitcoin stuff and turned into employee number one at Swan after, after the two founders, Jan and Corey. So it's exciting, man. It's been quite a year. So let's talk about building Swan and how that has been, I guess, how Citizen Bitcoin kind of prepared you for that. Well, one thing it did was build a network that I would need to tap for, for this work that I'm doing now for sure. Cause we, one of the first things we did was start a show for Swan and that made it very easy to do having that network kind of built up already and some trust as from other people as a, as someone who could host a show in the space and, and then all the conversations, I mean, just having to, one of the ideas that Tommy and I always talked about is the Feynman idea, those who teach learn, which I love. And just being, having to prepare for all of those episodes, reading everything, being forced, I guess, to, to sort of be in a position where I could talk with these people and, you know, eventually become somebody who could talk about Bitcoin on their own and, and flip, flip to the other side. So I've just learned a ton. And Citizen Bitcoin is really the spark that made that all happen. Yeah, I couldn't, I mean, obviously I couldn't be at Swan without it. So that's something I've been talking about on my podcast is this is a, just an emerging industry. It's a baby industry. It's just growing, especially the Bitcoin in industry in particular, right? Not just the crypto industry as a whole. The, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin only in industry. Yeah, exactly. The Bitcoin only industry and it's nascent, but it's, it's growing fast and it's built on top of Bitcoin. So of course it's going to, it's just going to blow up and you're here. And if you're listening to this, you're here early and there's massive opportunity in this industry over the next few years, five years, 10 years, it's just going to keep growing and growing. So if you, you know, keep learning, start putting some stuff out there, just produce something, put it out there. And that's your resume and companies are going to be gobbling up Bitcoiners. So that's that happened. It happened, you know, because of me putting the podcast out. That's how I got in touch with Corey. And so, you never know what's going to happen if you put some you know, put something out there, produce, and contribute something to the space, and, and you'll be rewarded. Like I said, it's early, so there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity out there. And Swan itself is a good point. Like we only hire Bitcoiners. <laughs> we Bitcoin Twitter is like our hiring space, and we have contact, you know, connections and. We only, we put out a tweet, like every one, a couple of positions, we put out a tweet and received a lot of really good resumes, tons of amazingly, like often overqualified candidates. Because people Bitcoiners want to work, want to work for Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. <laughs> and yeah. Bitcoin Magazine didn't always hire exclusively Bitcoiners, but ever since I've kind of like taken up the helm over at dot com, like that has been the strategy. And you know, when you work with people that are passionate about a subject beyond the work, there's nothing like it. You know, it's like working with, 
you know, it's, it's like working with people on superpowers, right? Like they'll put in 80 hour days whenever they'll work on weekends, whenever, who cares? Nights, yeah. day, early mornings, just Bitcoin. And yep. It's it inspires an incredible, just deep, deep work, uh, ethos and conviction. And, you know, I always, I like to say that it, it just starts, slowly takes over all your brain cycles like uh, whatever spare brain cycles there are bitcoin will fill them right up and th that is definitely the case so it, when i wake up in the morning i know and we, we were just saying this right before we started recording like you got to bring it in bitcoin every day it's just like bitcoin itself it's a ruthless competition <laughs> because everyone else is extremely motivated by this revolution that we're a part of we find ourselves a part of well before anybody else knows it, knows what's going on. So it's this privilege. You feel privileged to be a part of this thing in history and have somehow had your eyes opened to what is actually going on here. And that's massively motivational for everybody in the space. So you got to bring it because everyone else is coming in and bringing it too. And they just want to work in Bitcoin full time, you know, and that's going to happen more and more over the next year or two as Bitcoin only companies grow, they're going to be hiring Bitcoiners. And then, you know, normie companies are going to be hiring a lot of Bitcoiners too. Yeah, I can imagine a world where hardcore Bitcoiners that have built a reputation similar to like a Pierre or like a Matt Odell, there's many others who are building their reputations, you know, they're going to be required by non Bitcoin companies that want to learn about Bitcoin, you know, hey, my Michael Saylor reached out to notable Bitcoiners to teach him right to network with him to help him spread his own brand um and others will do the same so uh, there's so much opportunity for bitcoin and when you enter into like the bitcoin ecosystem full time or with more skin in the game than just you know trolling on twitter uh it really it, it changes your professional life yeah 100 percent. it just as much as it changes you on a personal level which we talk about a lot the truth of sound money makes makes you make different decisions better decisions i would argue because you're thinking more long term you're not caught up in the moment and trying to chase the quarterly earnings and trying to get rid of that fiat as fast as you can because <laughs> it's just going down in value it's not a store value anymore or you're parking it in, in some like you know fund or stocks and you find yourself becoming like a financial advisor you know i talked to this guy named uh noah Dr. Noah, two episodes ago on Citizen Bitcoin, super, super interesting dude, like just a renaissance man. He can do whatever he wants. He's super smart and just accomplishes shit. He's a climber, super accomplished climber. He's an ER doctor. He uh, got certification to be a financial advisor, not to actually work as a financial advisor, but just because he wanted to invest his own money and, and handle it properly. Uh, he started several businesses. He was on American Ninja Warrior for like seven seasons. <laughs> like This guy is crazy but that the point boss. was he total boss absolute boss and he's a bitcoin maximalist of course he so go listen to that episode it was good good stories mixed in with a lot of optimistic bitcoin talk he hey, became not to a interrupt financial you. advisor yeah not to interrupt you but if you haven't subscribed to citizen bitcoin or swan signal just stop the podcast go and search both of those and subscribe right now all right continue <laughs> yeah. Thanks, bro. He became a financial advisor so he could invest his own money. And we hear that a lot. It's you, you know, you're in a fiat world. You've got to park that money somewhere because this is a melting ice cube. It's not a store of value anymore. And so that's why we have monetary premiums and all these, you know, harder assets, real estate, and stocks, and whatever. It's infuriating, really. Uh, on that level. So I think kind of pulling it back to, you know, Bitcoin only industry and, and Bitcoiners and, and growing this, this industry, I think right now is the time and 2021 is going to be absolutely insane. There's going to be massive growth. There's people like Michael Saylor calling up Bitcoiners from Bitcoin Twitter and asking for advice. And that's happening every day, I'm sure. in you know, CEOs and, C-suite executives all over the country and businesses all over the world really are calling people, calling up people who have written really nice blog posts about Bitcoin to get some advice because there's no Bitcoin advisory companies out there, right? It just doesn't exist yet. 
like on a, on a large scale, like institutional level. And honestly, when they start developing, I, I'll question there. <laughs> I'll question them to the end. Um, I do, before we change topics and talk about Bitcoin more broadly, I want to focus in on like what Swan did to build the team, obviously focusing on hiring Bitcoiners, um, using Bitcoin Twitter as like where you post jobs or where you recruit. Um, but I mean, when you look down your lineup, it's just whether it's advisors or whether it's, you know, you know, on staff employees, just stacked. You know, I don't think there's anyone who has less than 10,000 followers that works for you guys. Um, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's really incredible. Like the amount of uh, just talent that you've been able to accumulate. Um, what has it been like, like kind of like, recruiting, talking about Swan's vision, talking about Bitcoin, like was that, how do you recruit this team? That's all Corey. That's all props to Corey. Corey is an incredible networker. He has worked at, you know, first of all, he has an incredible, like just ideal corporate resume, right? Like if you want to put in your resume, like Google or Microsoft or something like that, he's got the ideal resume uh, all the way from, you know, high school, college, all the way up through. He has worked at Microsoft and Google and he's raised a lot of money for businesses that are raising A rounds or B rounds or something like that. He'll sit right next to CEOs in these meetings and run the fundraising show. I think he's raised something like three quarters of a billion dollars or something like that over the last 10 years for companies. So he's got this deep, deep network and he put that skill to work as soon as he realized what was happening right he he was just like most of us was shit coining and he it clicked he became a bitcoin maximalist and he immediately he knew he had to work in the space he knew he wanted to start something up and so he started networking and he like a, a microcosm of what Corey does is he makes telegram groups and then just turns them into like the the place where people hang out. He loves to throw parties is the way he puts it. So there's like this, he's made like dozens of telegram groups and some of them take off, some of them don't, but they're all, you know, every one of them that has taken off is really cool. So he started this Bitcoiners group and that is a place where a lot of conversations happen. And it's, it's just an example of how Corey networks. So he identifies people that he likes. He works kind of works a lot on his gut. He's developed a good instinct uh, over his career and finds people who have, you know, a good kind of culture fit with our, with him and our squad. So he, the first one he identified was Jan and Jan is an absolute badass, right? Just one of the smartest people I've ever known. He was CTO at Reverb, co-founder there, I think too. And they sold to Etsy for like 300 million bucks. And so he was taking some time off and he realized actually he wanted to kind of get out of Reverb, Reverb because he had found Bitcoin and it was taking over all the spare brain cycles. So he, he left and wrote Inventing Bitcoin. Great and, book. Uh, you know, fantastic you want, book. Just like Bitcoin A to Z, you want to understand it, Inventing Bitcoin. Inventing Bitcoin. Yeah, it's the great, a great intro on why we need Bitcoin and then the best just run down in a couple hours of how the system works. And that's really all you need. It's a thin book. Like if you put your head to it, you could do it in one day. Easy. Easy. Yeah. It's a two hour, it's a two hour listen on the audio book. I think maybe a little over, but it's, it's uh, it's short, it's brief and it's really dense uh, with just knowledge, like concise, I should say. It's not dense, it's concise. So he went after Jan, he got Jan on board as co-founder and you know, it was kind of off to the races from there. Uh, I came on board and we had, there were several other contractors at that point uh, as well, who kind of just came on for a little while and, and then took off, kind of helped us get things started up. Uh, we have an incredible designer named Jordan Ruder. He's, uh, he's been a Bitcoiner for a long time and he is an absolute badass too. He wrote in uh, proactively and made some designs on how to re like redesign give Bitcoin, which was really just uh, kind of a, a very version 0.1 and had not had a lot of design love. So he redesigned the entire product and sent these beautiful mock-ups over to Jan. And it was just like, all right, you're in You're after like one in, one or two interviews, you know, with him, he's uh, absolute, absolutely amazing. Um, we have Brecky and oh, Brecky's also an amazing mind. I mean, he's, I love working with him every day. He's it's watching it like sitting in a, in a marketing meeting with him. It's just like, 
I have an idea. I have an idea. I have, what if we did this? What if we, it's just constantly. Well, the, and, and let me just shout out Brecky. I feel like we're going to just go and shout out everyone on the team at this point, but we got to, yeah. Brecky, like <laughs> the dude just has, he not only has creative ideas, but he ships and okay. Maybe not all of them hit, but like a lot yeah. of them hit, like he has a lot of good ideas and, and he always ships and he's so quick and timely. And like, like even like his voiceover videos that he was putting out earlier today, like I was laughing my ass off. It was yeah. so funny. That Christine Lagarde video is amazing. That, that one's the best. And I've been watching a lot of Christine Lagarde for Fed watch and he just nailed it. Just nailed it. <laughs> yeah. He can, he's amazing at impressions among many other talents. So yeah, he's great. Um, we brought on, Gigi, whoever I'm sure everyone listening knows Gigi, author of 21 Lessons, also an absolute badass. It, it, he ju- he wrote in to Corey and was like, "Look, I'm I'm trying to get into the space full time." And when Gigi says, "I want to work for your squad," like you just say, "Okay," and you make it happen. Um, Quidum, one of my favorite people in the space, uh, incredible writer, just a really cool guy. He and I really just get along really well. I feel. Uh, you know, just built a good connection with him over over the past couple of years, and get to work with him every day. He's amazing. Uh, and Reed Womack, finally, like he came out talking about coming out of nowhere and just like really establishing yourself. He became a Bitcoiner last year, like, uh, and stood out on his uh, application. He was writing a newsletter, just like Marty started it for his family, picked up steam, called Bitcoin Buddha, and he it, good writer that was his resume he sent it in we're like here's this newsletter here's the archive and i read through his newsletter and it was like cool like you're you write well you communicate well we had a good call you're on the team and it turns out to be also an absolute better so he's it's a good squad it's a lot of fun but it all comes back to Corey, you know recruiting and and just has those instincts to build build teams and build networks yeah, no, I mean, I, even just my experience with Corey has been the same. Uh, and that, that Bitcoiner group is fantastic alongside others that he has started. Uh, so uh, the other yeah. CK always give out props to him. Um, yeah. Let's talk about, okay, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about Bitcoin now. Like we've spent a lot of time talking about the Swan team and I love all you guys. Many of the team have been on the podcast. Whoever hasn't will be on the podcast soon. <laughs> um, but like, how are you feeling about Bitcoin these days um, as an educator too? Because it is, to me, it blows my mind when you hear, you know, the Paul Tudor Jones, like spewing Bitcoin memes, <laughs> the Michael Saylor's like going hardcore maximalists, like, you know, like how, what, how, what does that make you feel like? Uh, ugh, bullish as fuck, man. That's what it makes me feel. Look, what, watching Bitcoiners come in to this space now, and skip past all of the shit coinery and, and scams and deception that's out there. Projects passing them off as passing themselves off as some somehow like worthy of being an alternative to Bitcoin. Look, there are projects out there. Not everything's a shit coin. Not everything's a scam. Well, everything's a shit coin, but not everything's a scam. The reason I call every, everything a shit coin is because shit coin is about being money. It's a coin. It's money. So if you're trying to be money, it it ain't gonna happen. Money is, you know, tends toward one and we have one digital money and it's not looking back. You can't, you can't make a new Bitcoin. Sorry. Now, if you want to do something else with, you know, blockchain technology, quote unquote, then have at it. I'm all about experimentation, but trying to pass yourself off as a viable alternative to Bitcoin at this point is laughable. Um, But yeah, listening to people from Michael Saylor all the way down to uh, this, woman who I've gotten in, like just came on to Bitcoin Twitter like a week ago, Camilla, I don't know her last name. It's, I think it's part of her Twitter handle, but she became a Bitcoiner. She read the Bitcoin standard. She's a Bitcoiner. She's a maximalist. She's like on TikTok making videos and got a thousand followers on Twitter in one week. And you know, it's that I, I DM'd her because we're going to have her on Swan Lounge at some point to hang out. And I just want to hear a story, but that's awesome. It's awesome. All the way from Michael Saylor down to just, you know, people popping on Bitcoin Twitter and, and being like, all right, I'm in. This is my crew. And Here uh, for Bitcoin Twitter. I'm pretty sure I've seen her around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's because she read the Bitcoin standard and the bullish case for Bitcoin and all of these other pieces of work that didn't exist in 2017, right? Tons of podcasts are out there. Whatever your medium, you're going to find Bitcoin education that's high quality and we'll keep bringing up to speed super quickly. I mean, 
Michael Saylor being the headline of this year in that regard, who got to the conviction to put $500 million into Bitcoin within a couple of months, right? That's crazy. That's Huge crazy. Conviction. And that's happening. Yeah. And it, the beautiful thing is, is he is moving the Overton window for so much. Like he's not just moving it for corporations buying it, but now it's putting out yeah. bonds in order to buy it. And it's just like he, getting on Bitcoin Twitter and becoming like a freaking mascot. Um, he's, yeah. he, he, like, can you imagine 10 more Michael Saylors? Cause that's about to happen. Straight yeah. Up. Yeah, I love that. So I clip my favorite clip of Sailor was when he's on Keith McCullough's show on Hedge Eye, and he just like gets his eyes get really big, and he's just like, "What happens, Keith, when ten billionaires decide to drop in one percent of their net worth into Bitcoin? Your models are completely destroyed, devastated. Bitcoin goes to the moon, and he's just like it's just so intense." And I love it. I love it. And he's like a, he's like a poet. He's like a Bitcoin I, poet. I can now, tell that you watched take, that clip multiple times. <laughs> I'm sorry I, to interrupt. I clipped it. I, I clipped but, it and put it out. So yeah. But here's the thing. In that moment, he sounds exactly like Bitcoin Tina. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. It just, it blows my mind. It's amazing. It's amazing. Like Bitcoin's memes have the power, ha- just have this incredible power to permeate and just Bitcoiners distill them so well and in in mm. such a way that is so digestible. Like Bitcoin's the most complicated thing in the world. It's one of the most nuanced pieces of technology out there. But yet you have plebs running around yelling number go up, you know? <laughs> and, it, and that's yeah. how it works. Like it's crazy. Yeah. It's it's amazing. I love it so much. It's just what a time like like i said earlier it's just a like a privilege to be alive during this time and be experiencing this and and have this community and and sailor says you know he found his people like these are my people and i feel that very strongly as well you know i just love everybody in the space i love spending time on bitcoin twitter i feel like i know you know a thousand people out there really well now just through their reading their thoughts and conversing with them and bitcoin twitter is just a crucible for these ideas i mean you take everything all the video, all the long form content, all the podcasts, the writing, the books, all comes in to Bitcoin Twitter. These ideas, you know, in our minds, all of this gets distilled down into Bitcoin Twitter and we all, you know, just write it into 220 characters or less and eventually gets distilled down to three words. Somebody figures it out and finds the right combination of three words and that's it. That's the meme and it gets added to the, you know, to the library of Bitcoin memes and these things are going to find their way out, you know. Uh, into the into normie land and i think it's it's amazing it's amazing so let's talk about bitcoin twitter a little bit i think bitcoin twitter might be the most love hate thing in a bitcoiner's life um pierre (laughs) richard on his most recent podcast with bitcoin magazine said despite all of the criticisms against jack twitter is a fantastic means for clearing intellectual conversation and communication across the world um, you know, you can rub up against a, a senator and talk to them. You can talk to CEOs of companies. Um, obviously, you know, it, it is it is both so incredibly useful and the network is there, but yep. also so incredibly tainted. Like, mm-hmm. t- let's talk about Twitter a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I Bitcoin Twitter, obviously, I love to death. There is, I, I'm a very strong free speech advocate. There is a lot of speech. I mean, it's, it's a founding principle of this country and, and a principle that has led to uh, incredible, you know, innovations and progress uh, across, you know, time through, throughout human history, like speech itself. It's like the foundation of human civilization. It's the reason that we can advance ourselves generation after generation is that we can pass along our ideas, our desires, our needs, our solutions to one another with great, greater and greater clarity over time as languages have, have developed. Uh, and when we have restrictions on those ideas, and when we want to say, yeah, there's some really terrible, hateful people out there and they say terrible things. And there's people who are just going to say the most terrible things just because they think it's funny. Uh, 
but I, I think that's fine. Like that should be encouraged. That should be held dear because once we start, I mean, it's just a slippery slope. Once you start censoring, it's slippery slope. I mean, it's, it's something, it's an impossible task. And then it's all, you know, the, it's centralized. Like you're centralizing thought, like the, you're regulating, you know, thought from a central party and we're trying to move away from that. So Bitcoiners are really sensitive to censorship, I think, because of that reason. Like you're, you're centralizing something that should be free and open and decentralized, like language. Like, you know, it's like the basic technology that should be decentralized. So and it, I just think trying to regulate it is backwards and, you know, moves us backwards. So I'm glad that there are alternatives out there and they're going to pop up. You're not going to silence people. It's just not going to happen. They're just going to, you know, competitors will pop up and eventually your network effect will be destroyed uh, because you've, you know, over-regulated and over-censored. So that's a great point, right? And I actually think that that point translates really well to thinking about the dollar. And this is something I rub into a lot in my encounters with ETH heads who find it appropriate to constantly defend the dollar because they have to defend an idea of a stable coin and why that's better than Bitcoin. But the problem with the dollar is that it's a permission system and it's a permission system that's been weaponized. And that is its fault against Bitcoin. It, yes, it has a stronger network effect, but Bitcoin will always be more permissionless. And when the dollar says no, Bitcoin says yes every time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and as the dollar <laughs> like becomes that. more and more permissioned and more and more weaponized and bitcoin gets more and more liquid there comes to be a point where there's a tipping point and and bitcoin yeah. takes over um that's how i see it at least going down um do you, do you want to talk about like the dollar and you know your thoughts around that yeah sure i mean i tears law you know good money drives out the bad we're seeing that happen in real time the situation we're in now with COVID and all of the spending that's happening as a result of that really brought the future forward uh, in terms of pressure on the dollar uh, from Bitcoin being, being applied from Bitcoin. So we're, I think we're seeing the beginnings of a, what will what amount to a massive speculative attack against Bitcoin. Speaking of Pierre Richard, who wrote that article in July, 2014, uh, it's on the Nakamoto Institute site. The idea is simple. It's that you take out debt in the bad money and you buy the good money with it. And that's, so Saylor is doing that. And the reason people, <laughs> he offers 0.75% interest on this you know, corporate debt that he's offering, which is much lower than corporate debt is usually issued at because he knows that treasuries are, he you know, is betting that treasuries aren't going to, you know, go past 0.75%. Uh, and, you know, it's, there's, there's other factors involved in, in that number being uh, arrived at, but I, it's, it's a lot lower than most corporate debt is issued at. He is getting every, sing, milking every single dollar that he can out of the company that he's running in as, you know, in a relatively responsible way. Like he's, it's not a massive risk for his business, right? Because he's, he's got, you know, his, $30 million in, in cash. Not to, not yeah. to interrupt, but historically, this is a five-year bond. So historically speaking, right. Bitcoin has always been a good investment over a five-year period of time. So exactly. like, yes, this is not like a 90 day turnaround. You know, he has to pay right. this money back in five years and historically right. number go very up. Right. Exactly. And he's, thrown off a lot of cash every year. So he, he can, it, worst case scenario, you know, pay back that debt uh, or, you know, people can convert it into, into shares, whatever. But it's, when that cascades, right? First of all, you just start putting equity. You know, if you have cash balances, put that into Bitcoin. That's the first step. But then when the conviction rises to the level of taking out debt to buy the better money, that's when the speculative attack really starts to escalate and just domino effect. So yes, it is still very early, but gradually even suddenly, and I think that suddenly is a lot closer than it was 12 months ago because of COVID, because of the spending that's coming and because of everything that's happened this year to really de-risk Bitcoin in the minds of you know, rich people and rich institutions and rich companies. 
uh, it gives it gives people a lot of cover and, and confidence that this thing is here to stay. So that, of course, is also a network effect. I feel, I feel like the demand to hold Bitcoin will rise exponentially, and that's what drives the supply squeeze and number way, way, way up, because people are realizing that this is a long-term store of value. It's not a, a speculation, a short-term speculation to make cash. It's a way to avoid losing the purchasing power of the cash you're holding. And so that requires a long-term commitment. And I think, you know, obviously Saylor has talked about this very clearly, but I think the investors that are following on his heels and the institutions that are following on his heels are investing with that same mindset. They're not trying to flip this thing. And so when you start taking tens of thousands of Bitcoin off the table on a weekly basis, you know, mass mutual, like that was kind of a, uh, you know, it started to get boring, <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh, whatever, whatever, yeah, whatever, hundred million dollars. Cool. Yeah. Good job. They're, they're trying uh, to front run yeah. sailor on his fifth purchase or fourth purchase. <laughs> exactly. Like, all right, let's get like our this purchase. Guy, <laughs> this guy is going all out and he's, he's, you know, for good reason. So, yeah, I see this. Michael being Saylor's something insane, that man. really moving the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I've disagreed with him on a couple of things, uh, and we can talk about that if you want. But uh, all in all, like I just love what he has to say about Bitcoin and its, you know, its purpose and and w- the way he sees it affecting our future and and everything. But people are going to want to hold that narrative's out there. It's not just a narrative; it's you know proven at this point much more clearly as we've recovered from the depths of you know two and a half bear markets at this point um well so that's gonna that's gonna drive adoption like crazy so i want to talk about two things so the first thing is i want to talk about people are going to want to hold yeah when we started this podcast you mentioned a whole bevy of stores of values and how someone has to become a professional money manager in order to manage and deal with the risks that are associated with every kind of thing that is a store of value. But I would say that the fact that there's so many stores of value and people are trying to store value, like they, that's explicitly what they want to do shows clear and obvious demand for a simple, true store of value, um, like Bitcoin. (laughs) So like that, that that mentions people are going to want to hold like no shit. They've been breaking their freaking neck to hold, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is a property of money going back to the, you know, like emergence of money as, as a human technology. This is a basic necessity for money, of money. We, because we don't want to store our wealth in anything except the most saleable good. And if that, you know, the most saleable good by definition, if you're not living in a market with manipulated money, is going to also be among its other properties an incredibly good store of value has to be because people aren't going to demand it otherwise right it's uh, people understand people are very smart and and they understand that i'm working my butt off and i don't want this money to be worth less in five years than it was when i worked my butt off to get it and that's why Breedlove calls it time theft right inflation is time theft and it's it's really insidious it's really terrible it's it's a fucking tragedy really for humanity it's evil it's evil it's It's really pure evil evil. yeah so if if bitcoin is bitcoin is real money it's good money and the opposite of that is basically what we have you know created in this frankenstein's monster quote-unquote money that is the u.s dollar is has turned into a, a means of of control and and theft and just go to the the first the first chart on wtf happened in 1971.com and that's that's all you need to see that is the definition of time theft it's productivity continuing to rise at the same rate and mirac- like coincidentally or not you decide in 1971 wages go flatline so you know we're we're continuing to be more productive and creating more value with the time that we are spending working but we're not getting compensated any more for it than we were in 1971. It's messed up. It's a, it is evil. And I think we'll look back once we're living in the midst of the Bitcoin Renaissance and we'll look at the, the fiat dark ages as uh, just a, a tragedy, a tragedy yeah. akin, akin to a massive plague that, you know, really 
was at the center of, of the dark ages and that we look back on now in the 1500s, you know? I agree. No, it like the future will look like the Renaissance compared to right now, which is hard to think because, you know, we have all this technology, we have all this amazing stuff, right? But al- yeah. asset allocation is skewed. It's, it's manipulated. Everything we do is manipulated by sociopaths that don't know yep. any better. Like it's almost all political. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's, you know, which is crazy, but I want to bring it back to, to Michael Saylor and other influential, powerful people that Bitcoiners will onboard on because you mentioned that you've disagreed with him a little bit. Yeah. And I'm not surprised because they're still newbies. Like, yeah. These, yes, we have, we have made the onboarding cycle much easier to go from newbie to Bitcoin maximalist. But in terms of just being into this crazy world that is Bitcoin, like he hasn't been there for very long. He just yeah. hasn't seen that much. And all of the newbies won't. And Robert Breedlove was on Bitcoin Magazine Happy Hour last week and he disagreed with me. He's like, obviously we're shortening the education cycle and you know these people are understanding it better and better. Um, and they understand it better than us sometimes. And I agree. I agree. But still, nothing replaces experience being in the market. And Bitcoin yeah. is a brutal market. <laughs> yeah, it is. I agree. I agree, I agree with Robert. And, and I, I'm sure you do too, that the basic point that people are coming along a lot faster. Yeah. But I also agree Thanks with you. Us. Yeah, I also agree with you that, you know, you're coming up to speed and not necessarily thinking about like all of the aspects of Bitcoin, right? So like Sailor, for instance, he, his problem is he had a whole bunch of cash and he was sitting on a melting ice cube, like he said, and he wanted to figure out how to avoid the drastic drop in the value of his money. Uh, so the problem he was looking to solve was very specific, uh, one sort of aspect of Bitcoin. It was the store value aspect. And when he posts about the one of his tweets was that you know bitcoin is a store of value we don't need to worry or think about making it a medium of exchange it's going to be base money it's going to be the primary store of value in the future and that's fine that's enough that's enough like if bitcoin can do that that's enough and then he you know he followed right, it up though. with another he's right that it, it is enough. it would be it, it would be enough i agree with that but bitcoin can do so much more that is extremely important right so he followed that up with also that we're going to have to play nice with all the regulators and we'll see what happens. Bitcoin's going to be regulated and we're going to have to play nice. So I combine those two things into this. They come down to privacy to me because if we don't have a way to opt out of the payments Panopticon that's being built uh, slowly cash is, is, you know, going away. It's eventually going to be banned. We're going to have central bank digital currencies. It's going to go straight from the money printer into your, into your wallet. It's going to be like points. You're going to earn like, you know, plus 30 fed dollars if you do this certain behavior and shit like that. So at that point you have absolute control and vision into everybody's activity. Bitcoin and Lightning Network in particular can be a way to opt out of that. And we desperately need that, desperately need that. And I don't think Sailor has thought, I mean, or doesn't care because it's not his problem about the privacy preserving and freedom preserving aspects of Bitcoin as much you know, as he has the store value aspect because that's what's solving the problem he has right now. So people in Venezuela or you know, Argentina or living in a place with, uh, or China, for instance, uh, they will see Bitcoin as solving different problems. And I think those problems are all important and all big, all massive deals for humanity. Not, I mean, even though the store of value problem solving that would be enough, Bitcoin can do these other things. And those are just as important in my mind, uh, or, you know, close to it. (laughs) Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I kind of disagree with him on that front. I think you're probably right. He maybe hasn't thought about it. Maybe he has, and he really just doesn't care. That's fine, too. But I disagree with him on it, if that's the case. Well, and right now, I'm just going to try to make a comparison. Like, right now, we've invented flight. We've invented sound money. And we're trying to figure out how to grapple with it. And it took mm-hmm. a long time for them to design planes and train pilots perfectly every single time. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a huge learning curve in that, but even still, once we got to the point where 
we can design planes perfectly and we can train pilots perfectly to how to perfectly fly this equipment, it still takes experience. Nothing replaces experience. So, I mean, until Bitcoin is just money where you don't have to think about it, you have to grapple with a choice. It's just going to take experience. So like, I I don't like as long as there's a journey, you know, there's nothing going to replace that. And yeah, I mean, I, I think it helps. It's it's beneficial for a Bitcoiner to give newbies the benefit of the doubt that they're still newbies, no matter how high profile they are. Yeah. And, you know, we have blind spots too, living, you know, in the U.S., in the, in the country, in the world that has and, and owns and issues the world reserve currency uh, in a country that is relatively financially stable <laughs> compared to a lot of other places in the world, in a country that is still relatively incrementally free than a lot of the rest of the world, um, even to well, this point, even at this point. Yeah. I mean, you bring up great points. We have, it's guaranteed we have blind spots because we're so yeah. unbelievably privileged. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. And, yeah. And Bitcoin solves a lot of problems, not for us. Like exactly. it solves a store solves of value problem for sure for Western, for Western citizens and Western people. But uh, for other people, they have a lot more financial anguish that Bitcoin yeah. needs to say yes and solve for them. Yeah, and privacy anguish. And it's, more, it's going to be more and more important for us. It's increasingly important for us as well. I mean, we all live in a world that is bereft of privacy. And before Bitcoin, I was really just depressed about the state of privacy and the future and just really had resigned to the fact that we we're going to live in a world of radical transparency. Like where the point, the, the point is, it gets to the point where you just choose to reveal everything to everyone because it's already, you know, it's better that it's that way than in the hands of someone who could hold it against you, you know, uh, and manipulate you based on having an information asymmetry, you know, that you may not want to have public. Uh, I felt like that's where we are sort of being pressured into a world, a world like that. Bitcoin has shown that we can use cryptography in a way to really affect everyone. Uh, you know, uh, uh, give a technology out that's based on cryptography that everyone can use. I think it's, you know, besides HTTPS and SSL, the one of the most widely distributed cryptographic applications in the world. And I think it's going to really help the establishment of the idea that distributed privacy technologies, open source technologies are the way to build our future. It's the best way to build the future. I think it's Bitcoin's proving that, the internet and technology proving that. The idea that the Lightning Network is built, you know, sort of solved the mistake of the HTTP protocol that was, you know, it didn't really have security built in. We had to kind of back into it. So it's still not perfect. Lightning Network saw that problem and decided to build onion routing into the base layer of the, of the network, into the, you know, level two protocol. And so anything that's built on top of that will then benefit from the innate, you know, the uh, innate privacy of the Lightning Network. So I think that that's fantastic. And I think it's really going to change people's kind of perspectives and um, visions about what kind of future we can have. I mean, looking at, looking at these Goliaths, you know, and these, these uh, empires that we're facing, the American empire in particular, like, it's hard to believe that Bitcoin can make a difference against that kind of an enemy uh, on the privacy and the money front. But it's like, it's like, uh, you know, it's like Frodo. <laughs> it's like Frodo and the little hobbits going into the depths of Mordor and dropping that ring in there. Cause it's like, we've got, we've got this little, this little Trojan horse that's just kind of sneaking in and it, it's, it's just happening over and over and over again. That Trojan horse analogy is just happening over and over again. I love to see it. Yeah, the there's a cartoon out there called Bitcoin and Friends. It's a hilarious little Bitcoin themed cartoon. But the beautiful mm-hmm. thing about the cartoon is it it kind of depicts Bitcoin's own hero's journey. And you talk about the hero's journey a lot uh, on your podcast. But um, you know, Bitcoin kind of has its own little hero's journey playing out right now, and yep. it really is incredible seeing it just disrupt everything. And I had a tweet that I put out that said like. Who, like, seriously, who is dumb enough to bet against the native currency of the internet? 
Like yep. the internet's already destroyed everything else and completely subverted yep. and taken over it. Like, why would you bet against the native currency of it, right? Um, yep. And and personally, I think that Bitcoin is the impotence for building the decentralized web. Like people talk about Web three and all this stuff. Like Ethereum is still stuck in Amazon server rooms. It's not disrupting anything. Bitcoin is building the self hosted world where people actually self host their own servers and they help self host their own routing systems and the incentivizes the mesh network of the mesh internet to be born. Right. And Bitcoin's decentralization enables the bootstrapping of other decentralized um, and censorship mm -hmm. resistant and privacy um, forward things like the lightning network. Um, and I just haven't seen anything else doing that. Yeah, there's no, I mean, there's no competition on that front. I think we can do a lot to improve Bitcoin's decentralization and we should focus on that because that is really the, the fundamental property that makes all of these wonderful, uh, you know, features of Bitcoin possible. It really comes down to decentralization and that's why, you know, UAS, UASF was so important in, in a lot of ways because it was all about decentralization. One, about keeping the block size limited to, you know, make it easier uh, over time to run a node, but also because the, it proved that Bitcoin's governance is decentralized among the user base and not concentrated uh, uh, in, uh, like among the miners and the companies, the, the more powerful entities in Bitcoin. And that was massive. That was a huge inflection point in Bitcoin's history. I think we'll look back and see that as like really the moment where it became uh, viable. Like that was, really the birth of, of Bitcoin in a lot of ways in the, in the Bitcoin that we will have for a long time to come. And Bitcoin, the store it, of value. Yeah. The store of value and the, and the, it, it was a test of the, gold. Exactly. And it was a test of the, of the decentralization of the network. And I, the bigger thing to me was the, the governance question was resolved once and for all. And you still, you'll hear people coming in to Bitcoin. There was a, a woman, a reporter who is like a, a tech reporter who was posting about how, you know, it's, it'd be really easy to 51% attack Bitcoin through minor centralization. And only, you know, only X number of pools uh, need to collude to break the network. And first of all, it's like, you know, don't you think we would have thought about that <laughs> by now? I mean, it was on Bitcoin talk forum in 20, 2009, you know, like I was one of the first posts, you know, when, uh, you know, people trying to, you know, steel man the idea. And no one goes back through history though. Yeah. And so, you know, I he came on and, and was like, look, you got it backwards. You know, the, the users control the network. The miners want to, you know, mine the chain the users want to use. They could fork and give them all 5,000 Bitcoin per block. Uh, but no one, that Bitcoin is going to be, you know, quote unquote, Bitcoin is going to be worthless because no other users are going to use it. The users give it value. The demand gives it value. So, you know, it's, that was a, a massive question. And we do need to make sure moving forward that we continue to prioritize that because we are going to have, you know, bigger players who aren't super concerned about decentralization necessarily. They might even, you know, want to have it more centralized because they have, they have a, a lot of it and they would love to, this is how money gets co-opted. So uh, we need to be vigilant on that front for sure. So well, I think we at, need to really privacy look and at decentralization. Segwit 2X. Look at Segwit2x, like attacks, don't always look like attacks even to attackers but segwit 2x was led by all of the corporations in bitcoin yep. at the time the miners exactly. and the the companies um exactly. so that i mean that incentive will continue yeah absolutely i mean it's it's why money gets co-opted you the, the power to print and the power to control the money is you know it's let's go back to let's go back to tolkien man like to, to have the one ring, that's a irresistible power. The only, you know, the only one that could resist it was the little guy uh, who comes in and, and, you know, breaks down the massive empire. And that's what Bitcoin is. It's, you know, it's, it's destroying the one ring <laughs> to rule them all. And it's the first time in human history that we've had that ability. We've had a technology that can do that. So we can finally see what it's like to live in a world with a free money. And man, I think it's going to just have ripple effects out to every aspect of our lives. And I'm, I'm excited to see what the next 50, 100 years brings. You know, I, I don't know how long I'm going to live, 
but you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of this for my kids and my grandkids and so on. This is the long-term thinking that's instilled because I know that the value, the sats that I'm stacking right now, I have very high confidence that it's going to be worth a lot more in a hundred years than it is now. And it's going to retain that value over time. So it's actually money that is worth, you know, like stacking with the long-term in mind. That's, that's what it's all about, man. No, absolutely. Generational thinking. That's what Bitcoin yeah. brings back to the world. Like we've lost exactly. that. We can't even take care of our parents anymore. You know, yeah. the reason why COVID is destroying old people homes is because, you know, we've centralized old people. They used to be decentralized with their, their family. <laughs> um, yeah. Brady. Well, and we, we, we don't have money. We don't have money, right? Like we don't have purchasing power to help them out. Like, you know, so yeah. even the if time we want- theft is, it goes so deep. We could get so cosmic. Yeah. Um, Brady, yeah. I think it's, it's time that we need to, to wrap up the show and I need to get ready for Bitcoin happy hour. But um, nice. I think there's a good time. I want to ask you about like, if you could talk about one, like the most cosmic outcomes that Bitcoin delivers in your mind like, that you've been thinking on. I know you've been thinking about the Bitcoin renaissance for the first, for a long time. You are the citizen Bitcoin, right? You know, yeah. um, <laughs> Uh, so like what, what, what's the most cosmic, what is the most cosmic like outcome of Bitcoin? I mean, literally cosmic Bitcoin is space money, right? Like it's money that will allow us to, the reason I call it the Renaissance is because it's money that will allow us to pursue our dreams. It'll free up our time to allow us to pursue what we're passionate about. If we don't have to work, for someone for 40 or 50 years because my money is decreasing in purchasing power every year that I just have to keep refilling those coffers over and over again, then I have literally thousands and thousands of hours back that I get to spend doing what I want to do, what I'm passionate about, what I want to see happen in the world. And so that really unleashes, Bitcoin's really unleashing human imagination in the future. And our imagination is limitless. So we're going to go to the stars and we're going to, you know, have incredible healthcare technologies. Who knows? Well, we're already on the path of creating a world where we are extending the human lifespan by a year, every year, like then, then you're at escape velocity, right? Because, you know, it's, you're living, you know, longer and longer and longer and the technology is getting better and better. So I could see a world where humans are living far longer. We're exploring far, much farther into space than we ever imagined. We are having, we're having two sort of technological, I'm sorry, uh, exponential revolutions at once that, as Jeff Booth talks about, reinforce one another. Technological deflation, uh, cost of deflation and, and exponential advancement and, and, and Bitcoin, which is deflationary money. So those go hand in hand and sort of reinforce one another. I think like the most cosmic future that I can imagine and the most hopeful and optimistic future that I could see Bitcoin helping usher in is like a Star Trek world where we're really just exploring all the human basic needs are met with very low amount of, of effort and that we get to then expend that effort on our imagination. And I think that that's going to be beautiful, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is, that is a Bitcoin renaissance is this a beautiful Star Trek world where people can benefit from technological deflation. The fact, like, again, this is a whole another podcast, but if you look at how miners, like old S9 miners are still mining on the network, Bitcoin yeah. does not waste. Like, we, like, how often do you replace your iPhone? Every two to three years. Like, Bitcoin doesn't waste. Bitcoin will use that iPhone till it, like, till it dies, if, yeah. if it was on a Bitcoin standard. And that's just one way that like, I kind of think of or try to think about like what a, a money that embraces deflation looks like. Brady, what's your last word and where can people find you? Yeah, uh, you know, the best way to buy and invest in and build a position in the world's humanity's history's best money ever at a point in time where it's probably the best like risk reward ratio ever because of the, the amazing events that have happened this past year and we're still sitting under all time high is to stack them regularly with automatic recurring buys at swanbitcoin.com. If you decide and you have a, st a chunk of cash, we now support uh, one-time buys. So you just come in, 
drop your plunk down your your cash on the table, buy some Bitcoin, and then just set up auto recurring buys. I think that's the best way to do this and approach this. Uh, we have you know educate yourself, listen to read Bitcoin Magazine, listen to Bitcoin Magazine podcasts, um, and just engage, man. Go out and build and do something, contribute something, and I think you'll be able to be a part of in a you know in a more uh, I guess you'll be able to spend more of your time on doing what you want to do, which is, you know, study and write about and think about Bitcoin. So get out there. <laughs> Hell yeah. Get out there. And while you're at it, make sure to follow Bitcoin magazine at Bitcoin magazine. You can follow me at CK underscore snarks, five star reviews, subscribe, like all the above. See you guys later. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>